a second. Ah, you're a pretty good kid, I'll tell you. These stupid glasses. Uh, I was using St. Teresa's for a while, and then uh, the uh, uh, I did this a couple years ago. Uh, I did a history of St. Teresa's, the same basic idea with, the, with the older people, and uh, <coughs> so Capital District. Uh, meanwhile, they went out. They had so many requests for this type of project. They bought it. So I'm, I'm using there as like capital mm -hmm. district teaching teaching center. Yeah, it's up in East Greenbush. Oh, teaching center. Yeah, and so uh, they, they're putting on uh, in the fall. They're co-sponsoring with I don't know if you know Ernie Mobley. He's a uh, director of the New York State Memorial. And they're putting together programs on state at state university for teachers, anybody else on the Vietnam War, and they're mm. veterans and everybody else uh, yeah. involved. You know. So, uh, is this because teachers are having a hard time teaching this subject because it's so current, or uh, yeah, I think that's so controversial? Well, I, think that, I think that's part of the problem. The curriculum has changed. There haven't been enough and textbooks was, written about it. And you know, like the textbook we're using at the schools uh, might have a page or two on it. So other than you know, you can get platoon, and you can <laughs> get you know, you can get all those type of things. Yeah. But, but basically, there's there's not a lot of materials out there, and. Uh, so all of a sudden there's a big rush, and that's, you know, I just happened to be at the right time. Uh, you know, the thing the mom is doing is a lot more in-depth and detail. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, like he's going to have veterans, he's going to show that Carnet fell on the Vietnam War, and then divide it in half, uh, and have like one hour showing it, then the veterans uh, are going to, you know, talk about, you know, like if there's, if it was Ted, mm -hmm. then that's, then they'll have veterans who have Ted, you know? Yeah. And uh, I'm going to sit over here so I make sure you face the camera. And, uh, then, uh, uh, like Dow was going to do, I talked. I talked to him. He said he would like to do it. You know, so, uh, you know, so he's going to do it. Hmm. Is this good? I'm, I'm trying. I want to make sure I get you facing the camera, and I, so I don't have to be on. I, a lot of them I'm not even on. So, I'm on. You ready? So I'll just, uh, I'll just start it, and then uh, I'll get you to jump in when you had enough. Just, just say okay, please. Okay. Is is part of the Greater Capital District. Teaching Center grant entitled, It's Time Has Come, Supplementary Materials for Teaching the Vietnam War. We have the pleasure and honor today interviewing Dr. Richard Levine, well-known Albany physician, uh, who, if you were here, has a very, very busy schedule, and we certainly great, glad that you could take a couple minutes to talk this day. Thank you very much. My pleasure. For the, uh, for the sakes of, uh, we call it the sake of genealogy, we always like to start off with a little background, you know, uh, uh, how prior to you going to Vietnam, maybe where you went to school, this type of thing. Okay, I was actually born and raised in Albany, New York, and uh, went away to college, came back to Albany to go to medical school, and was in my second year of postgraduate training at St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City um, when I found out that I was getting orders to go to Vietnam. Part of the background that might interest people has to do with how physicians were drafted into the service in those days. Um, all doctors uh, up until after the Vietnam War were eligible for the uh, draft in the military. And the military had a plan called the Berry Program, named after a physician, I believe, who, uh, who uh, initiated this program in the service. And every physician registered with the draft uh, when they came out of medical school. And they were, uh, they were all allowed to do one year of, of uh, internship and then became eligible for the draft. The Barry Pro program allowed you to apply for a deferment until you finished your residency. And the way this worked, uh, if you were interested in surgery and you were doing a four-year residency in surgery, then at the end of your internship year, you applied for the Berry program in surgery. 
And what the military did was they, they tried to calculate four years down the line how many surgeons they would need. And at that point in time, they, they took all the applications for uh, surgery deferments and chose uh, out of, uh, randomly out of, uh, of, of, essentially out of a hat, the number of uh, uh, people they thought they would need in surgery four years down the line. If you were chosen, you were deferred for your three or four year surgery training and then it was assumed you would win the service at the end of that time. Of course, you would go in as a surgeon as opposed to a general medical officer. In my case, I applied for the Berry program in internal medicine and uh, found out sometime later that I was not chosen. You, had, you then have an option of either going in at the end of your internship year or you can take one year of, of residency but then you automatically have to go in at the end of that second year. Needless to say that uh, during the Vietnam War most people uh, who were not chosen to, for their uh, specialty in the Barry program did choose to take one more year hoping the war would end before they had to go in the service. And um, in my case I elected to take that second year and um, it was actually uh, probably in the springtime of that year uh, before you got your orders on where you were to be assigned in the service. And it was an interesting time because some of us were planning to get married and uh, we were just waiting for our orders to find out if we were going overseas or whether we were going to be assigned somewhere uh, in the continental United States. In my case, I remember waiting and waiting and trying to make plans to get married, finally calling Washington, D.C., and uh, having a secretary tell me that I was lucky enough to be going to Vietnam. Uh, so that is how I ended up uh, uh, going to Vietnam. At the end of my, I had one year of internship, one year of residency at St. Vincent's in New York, and then I reported to uh, Fort Sam Houston in uh, San Antonio, Texas. We had five weeks training, and then uh, then you were shipped off uh, from the West Coast to Vietnam. Before, uh, could you put some dates on, on things there for me? Yeah, I got it. I graduated from medical school in uh, June of 1967. I started my internship in St. Vincent's Hospital in New York, July 1st, 1967. And uh, I stayed there until uh, June of 1969. <clears throat> I went from, uh, in August of 69, went to Fort Sam Houston, and uh, September of 69 shipped out for uh, Vietnam. I'm going to stop for one second. Do um, right. you mind if I turn the slide on? No. Because it, I'm getting a little shadow right behind you. I think we're right. Right. Isn't it funny because uh, teachers were, were exempted, I don't know, during the war? Well, a lot of people were. Like you if know, your I would wife was pregnant or if you... I hope that worked. I, I, got, I didn't see it before. But... Is this light all right? I think this light's fine. Okay. Now. Just got to... Do you mind if I do this one? No, throw that one out. Uh, I just... No, no, you better like it. It freaks it down below your... Uh, I'm kind of curious, what kind of training did physicians get? You said you were in uh, Fort Houston for five, was it wasn't military, was it? Oh, yes. Oh, it was military. Actually, it was, it's interesting. At any given time, there were probably 5,000 doctors down at Fort Sam Houston. Fort Sam is a huge army base that, that deals with all the medical corps in the, in the army. That includes physicians, medical service corps, uh, and all the medics in the army. Of course, at Fort Sam Houston is where Brook Army Hospital is, which is a big burn center in the, uh, in the Army. But we received uh, training in, um, in, believe it or not, in marching, in, uh, in uh, classroom work, in map reading, uh, treating snake bites, um, uh, traumatic injuries, how to do an emergency tracheostomy, and then they t they did take us out. Of course, we had to learn all about the military uh, uh, chain of command and, and the uh, the 
the various uh, uh, ranks in, in the service, etc., and, and a little bit about how the whole military administration worked. But they also took us out of the field. They have uh, what they call uh, their field is Camp Bullis, which is outside of San Antonio, and we went out on the Maparine course. Uh, we went out. We we actually crawled underneath the barbed wire with the machine gun bullets uh, flying overhead, both during the daylight and at night, which was kind of interesting with all the tracer bullets uh, going over your head. And, and many physicians were not used to this type of thing. Uh, we all bumped into each other on the map, <laughs> map reading course, and they did send a helicopter out just in case someone got lost. <laughs> I will say that uh, we didn't have to stay out overnight, and we did ride back and forth uh, from Camp Bullis in air-conditioned buses, and we lived in motels while we were down there. It was not the most difficult thing in the world. It would have been actually quite nice if, uh, if you weren't going to be in there. We, we, uh, we actually enjoyed the, the five weeks there, and, and uh, uh, of course the military provides everything you, you would need, including money. And uh, So I can't say that I, if I had not been going to Vietnam, I would have enjoyed my five weeks at Fort Sam. I've never, I've learned something. I never knew the doctors, the prepared doctors, which okay. makes common sense that they would have. Did you uh, form any, uh, uh, by the date you're talking about, had it taken place, uh, did you form any uh, conceptions of Vietnam prior? You know? <coughs> Um, I uh, basically only knew what what uh, I read in the newspapers. And um, um, are you asking? Did I form any? Did you have any opinions? opinions about the validity of the war before just, I went, or just opinions about what it was going to be like before I uh, arrived over there? Either one. You know, you uh, specifically the war. I have to say that uh, probably physicians that went to Vietnam <clears throat> were a little bit older than, than the, uh, the foot soldiers and the, um, uh, the college students who were doing a lot of the protesting. In some respects, we probably came a little bit after, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we came a little bit before and had grown, gone through our education before the true uh, protests of the war were occurring. Probably physicians tended to be a little more conservative, and uh, and were willing to accept uh, what the government uh, had thought was the right thing to do, uh, and and our generation had not gotten into a lot of uh, protesting because the war was probably in its infancy when we were in college, and and then we had four years of medical school after that. And uh, I really think a lot of the protesting probably started around the time I got to know. That's a good, that's a good point. You know, that's uh, something I would have been, it wouldn't be yeah. apparent that doctors were older than oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you, four years of college, four years of med school, and at least two years of training, so. So it'd be what, new 25, 26, somewhere in that area? Uh, that's probably older than that. I, uh, I was about 28. That's a good point. That's, um, I, it was interesting in the sense that uh, uh, I had a younger brother who who uh, was in college at the time, and uh, he and his wife were active uh, protesters at, at Georgetown, uh, which is my alma mater, and uh, they were on Key Bridge, and it was interesting. Uh, Stopping traffic and uh -huh. that and the other thing, and it was interesting to get letters from him. And he got letters from me, and, and obviously uh, he had his viewpoint. I didn't realize while I was over there how uh, how much was taking place back there. You, you really, uh, I guess, couldn't fathom or couldn't get a good sense of uh, of how much uh, protest activity was was taking place back there. Although my, my brother being involved, uh, probably, uh, uh, I, I, I did realize something was going on. When did you arrive in Vietnam? Uh, I believe it was September 10th, 1969. Uh, you recall your first impression? Oh, yeah. It was, if I had one word to describe 
my, uh, my time in Vietnam from the time that I left the States, including my first impression until the time I left to come home was, was one of uh, depression. Um, <clears throat> you, we, we flew out of Travis Air Force Base at 11 o'clock in the evening. We just checked that out. This is the wonders of uh, modern science. <clears throat> On arriving in Vietnam, we, we left uh, Travis Air Force Base at 11 o'clock at night. And flying in that direction, uh, <clears throat> you ultimately are crossing the international date line. So with a stop in Hawaii and another stop in Guam, uh, the, the flight took eight, 18 hours. Uh, 16 out of the 18 hours you were in the dark and the plane was loaded to the hilt with uh, with guys in combat fatigues and, uh, and guys in uniforms and then people like myself were there with uh, civilian luggage, etc. Um, on leaving Guam there were obviously planes heading back toward the States with men that were finishing their one-year tour. And there were guys like myself who were leaving uh, heading toward Vietnam to start their tour. And when they announced your plane, your flight was boarding uh, to arrive in Saigon, the ones coming home sort of uh, give uh, a cheer and uh, wish you well and, and, and uh, they're obviously happy as a lark that, uh, that they're going in the opposite direction. Uh, when you are in the area of, uh, of Vietnam, you absolutely do not know what to expect. You, you assume there's probably uh, combat uh, and, and bombings and explosions going on, and you're, you're looking at the play and wondering what this year will bring. and. Uh, <coughs> On arrival at uh, at Benoit Air Base in in, uh, in uh, down near Saigon, they basically board you on buses, and, and the bus ride from there to uh, to Long Bin, which is the trans the, uh, the the transportation center or the uh, uh, relocation center uh, for all Army incoming Army uh, people in, in Vietnam. You immediately have a first impression of the country that uh, that it's quite dirty, that uh, that your year will will be much different than the type of life you're used to in the United States. You see uh, you see natives uh, washing their laundry in in, uh, in the river. You see kids um, excreting in the streets and, and in the river. Uh, you see huts that are made out of uh, uh, everything from thatched roofs to, uh, to aluminum, uh, from, from uh, beer can aluminum that somehow makes its way to, to Nam, uh, and uh, there's very little in the way of paved roads. And, and you realize that you have 365 days ahead of you of uh, of um, uh, somewhat less civilized and possibly dangerous uh, times ahead, and obviously this brings on a lot of uh, anxiety, and, and uh, uh, you can't help but be somewhat depressed. I spent uh, three to four days at Long Bin waiting to find out where I was going to be assigned, uh, and of course. <coughs> There are helicopters scurrying overhead, and uh, and uh, uh, South Vietnamese uh, national uh, people, as well as military people, scurrying about, and army trucks scurrying about, and uh, and all.
all of a sudden you realize it's going to be a long, drawn-out uh, year. <clears throat> In typical Army fashion, they um, you sleep on a cot in a, in, a, in a room with a lot of other people, and uh, at 3 o'clock in the morning they finally come in and rouse you out of bed uh, one night and tell you you're due over in the airport and to hurry up and get dressed. And of course when you get to the airport, uh, it's a matter of sit and wait until 10 o'clock in the morning when you finally board a plane to, to head up country, which is where I was headed. Uh, they, they just tell you you're going up country, you really don't know where that is or what that means. But with me, after two or three stops along the way, we landed in uh, Cameron Bay. Uh, at each stop, uh, you're, you're still in the dark. You assume there's a courier who will come to pick you up, but usually it's a long wait. And uh, ultimately, uh, I, I was driven from Cameron across the, a bridge to uh, another town, which I can't the name of which I can't remember, and that was where my, uh, I realized I was assigned to an engineer brigade, and, uh, and there was a uh, former OBGYN man from Puerto Rico who was in charge of deciding where I was going to be assigned from that point. Uh, I'll never forget his major job at, at his base where he was, uh, was to build an, o an officer's club for the, uh, for the officers that were there. And he, there were three doctors that arrived uh, at the same time, and I never forget, he said, one of you is going to go up to the DMZ, the other two, we don't know where you're going. So you assume, well, you're either going to be lucky or unlucky. And uh, your first night up country, you, you're, you're introduced to outgoing uh, artillery shells, which uh, at first glance you assume were incoming, but uh, you 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 get used to these uh, noises, and, um, and uh, obviously the more you learn, the, the less uh, anxious you are. I was lucky enough to be assigned to an engineer battalion whose uh, headquarters was, was at a place called Fan Rang, which is uh, 40 miles south of Cameron Bay, right, on the, uh, right along the coast. It was a fairly good-sized city, and there was an Army uh, or an Air Force uh, base there where our battalion headquarters were located. And basically, what I did for my full year there was I was a battalion surgeon for, a, for an engineer battalion which built roads in Vietnam. This is one, one aspect of the war that people don't realize. We, we rebuilt all the roads that the French had originally built uh, in Vietnam. Uh, my battalion built an area on Highway 1, which was the highway that went along the coast. <clears throat> it started uh, probably about 20 miles below. Our, our, our uh, area of operations was from about 20 miles below Cameron Bay, directly south along the coastline uh, to about 40 miles below Fan Rang. And then, uh, of course, there were other battalions that built uh, on, on either side of this area. We also built Highway 13, which went from Fan Rang directly west to the uh, Central Highlands and uh, up on top of the, uh, the uh, mountains uh, at the end of our battalion uh, area of operations was a, a city in Vietnam called Da Lat, which was uh, a very famous city where, uh, where the Vietnamese military academy was located and uh, supposedly was a at one time a vacation land for uh, <clears throat> one of the Roosevelts who used to go to uh, hunt lion and tiger uh, in that part of the world. <laughs> the, the, uh, the engineering part of the war is very interesting. Uh, I don't think a lot of people realize how much manpower and how much equipment uh, we had over there for construction. Not only did did we have a whole engineer uh, command over there, which, which obviously had to build the airfields, had to build the, uh, the highways, the, uh, any of the major buildings uh, over there, and, uh, and the large bases. Um, but uh, we had combat engineers that, that were responsible for building the areas where there, 
might be combat. Um, we ha our battalion had the capability of of uh, making their own base course and making their own asphalt for these roads, and everything was portable. They would go when they completed a section of road, they would go scout out another rock quarry, um, and when they found the appropriate place, they would move their whole rock crushing operation down the road to this new rock quarry set up. And they would blast rock, they would crush rock and, and, and form a base course. We had a platoon that had nothing but dump trucks. There were 35 dump trucks in this platoon. And these uh, GIs, for six days a week, did nothing but drive dump trucks. Uh, they loaded with one thing or another, drove out to the job site, emptied it, and uh, drove back. And of course, this also means they pulled uh, maintenance on their vehicles morning and night, six days a week. Um, they had an asphalt plant where they would make their own asphalt. So these were actual paved roads, and uh, it was interesting because, um, first of all, the, uh, the Viet Cong uh, used these roads at night. Uh, no one went out on the roads at night unless you were in a convoy. And there used to be a common joke that uh, if, if, if we spent days putting in a culvert, and if the VC didn't like the way it was put in, they would blow it up and we'd have to start over the next start over the next day until they, we got it right. <laughs> um, one of the roads uh, up into the Central Highlands, I'll never forget, we called uh, we called it Good View Pass. This was a very windy road and uh, with a lot of heavy equipment. We had earth moving equipment, we had uh, bulldozers, we had uh, road levelers, we had people that went up there and did the uh, surveying, and we had surveyors, these are all military people. And uh, we actually had serious uh, industrial accidents, we actually lost people uh, in some of these accidents. But uh, uh, we built this road up through the mountains, and some of the most interesting and most beautiful country you'd ever want to see, uh, because the, the mountain yard people lived in huts in these trees up in, uh, up in the uh, mountains and uh, there were beautiful uh, foliage and, and, and it was a gorgeous view and interestingly enough right where this road was being built there was a hydroelectric power plant which had been built by the Japanese and uh, when the Japanese had built this power plant they had moved in and built a small village of, of semi-modern houses and there was a swimming pool of course these were all abandoned and the, uh, the pipes that uh, brought water down from the reservoir on top of the mountain down into this power plant were obviously blown up uh, in the course of the war, but there were still people assigned there to, uh, to keep uh, maintenance on the uh, machinery. And I've always wondered whatever happened to that power plant uh, since, since we left over there. So I was with the engineers. I, I had uh, the responsibility of handling the health care for, uh, for my battalion. Um, we had three or four companies out in the field, plus our battalion headquarters were back in uh, Fan Rang. I had tremendous uh, medics who uh, were very well trained. Uh, we had an aid station in each company area, plus a large aid station back in the uh, battalion headquarters. And there was sick call every day at the battalion headquarters, but many days uh, I would go out and spend the night in the uh, company areas with my medics out there. Many times for nothing else but to have some uh, diversion and, uh, and also to give some moral support to the, uh, to the medics that were out in the field a good part of the time. Um, simply by chance, uh, because the physician that I replaced in this battalion happened to be the group surgeon they automatically made me the group surgeon. What that simply meant was that uh, <clears throat> we all had to write a monthly uh, re summary of the medical activities of our battalion for that month, and this obviously included uh, very important uh, statistics, which were the incidence of uh, malaria and venereal disease in your battalion for that month. This was very important to the commanders because the, uh, this was a command uh, um, indicator that uh, if your malaria rate was high or your VD rate, rate was high, your 
uh, it was a negative uh, uh, mark on the commander of the, uh, of the unit. It meant either the men weren't taking their malaria pills, which they were supposed to be taking, or they were uh, either not educated or not interested enough to try to avoid uh, getting VD. And as the as the um, the group surgeon, basically, I took reports from the other battalions in our group and correlated them and, and made a group report every month. But it was uh, it was interesting because, in, in, again, in typical army fashion, uh, on one occasion. This one company, uh, which was up near the border with uh, Cambodia, who happened to be in our group, was having a lot of malaria. It was just an inordinate number of cases of malaria. <coughs> and uh, to show you how the Army worked, the immediate knee-jerk reaction was, get the group surgeon up there to find out what's going on. Of course, this made me laugh, because there was a physician up there who had the exact same training that I had. They didn't care. They wanted somebody up there. They even sent an airplane to pick me up and get me up there. And um, um, basically gave you an opportunity to go up and, and meet another physician and meet his medics, walk around and, uh, and uh, talk with him about the cause for the malaria in this one company, which is way out in the middle of nowhere, and, uh, and then come back and make a report, which really uh, wasn't any different than what this physician would have written himself. But it, as a matter of fact, they don't send a plane to pick you up and bring it back. You're on your own, get it back. Oh, nice. But they, uh, they do get you up there, and they do get the report, which is basically <laughs> what, they, <laughs> what the military wants. They don't care. It seems like they don't really care too much what it says, or uh, they won't listen to the fact that there's somebody up there already who's capable, but uh, they just want somebody up there. So basically, that was my year in Vietnam. I, I had the opportunity. You do have an opportunity as a physician that after six months in the field as a battalion surgeon, you can apply to go to one of the hospitals, which uh, might be safer and might be uh, um, a little more relaxing. Uh, in my case, I felt I was in a fairly safe area, and, uh, and I made so many friends, and uh, uh, I wasn't too concerned about uh, combat where I was that I decided to stay on the, out the field. Can I see a couple questions about sure. the Vietnam experience? Any new medical practices come out of the war that you're aware of? Any new medical practices? Any new medical practices. You know, I, I can always think of the Spanish-American War, okay. the edge of malaria, you know? Well, the, you think of the Second World War when uh, um, <coughs> Winthrop Sterling over here in Rensselaer came up with DDT to get rid of the uh, mosquitoes and, and uh, the carriers for yellow fever. Um, as far as I know, other than a tremendous amount of experience in treating trauma, um, uh, which I'm sure surgeons could, uh, um, could give you a lot more information on, on surgical techniques, treating burns, and uh, and uh, battle uh, field uh, surgery. Um, I'm sure many um, innovative ideas on, uh, on uh, types of, of clothing to wear in, in a hot, humid uh, uh, part of the world, which which would be the most healthy for an individual probably came out of uh, came out of this war. I'm sure there was a lot of um, uh, there was a lot of snake bites and uh, 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 probably a, a lot of parasit parasitology that might have come out of uh, Vietnam. But other than surgery and for major trauma and combat uh, <coughs> surgery. I don't know of any other, uh, any significant innovations that came out of uh, this war like the other one. I'm sure people would probably say that the, the medical treatment during Vietnam was probably much more sophisticated than, uh, than any other war. The main reason was uh, helicopters. Uh, we had medevac helicopters that could get just about any place and get someone to a field hospital 
very quickly, whereas uh, in other wars, I presume you were you were much more isolated, and uh, this was much more difficult. But uh, we we had uh, a tremendous uh, me medical evacuation service. They had the capability from a field hospital to get people flown to Japan, and uh, and even uh, with the huge uh, uh, flying hospital uh, planes they had to get somebody back to uh, San Antonio, Texas, to the uh, to the burn center if, if if need be within 24 hours. So wow. transportation and um, and evacuation were probably much better in this war than any other war. Did you have any contact with the people South Vietnam themselves? Uh, yes. What was their reaction to you? To well, she was American. The main people you you had con we had contact were with were number one. There were, every army base had uh, South Vietnamese civilians working on their army base. Uh, they were very friendly. Uh, they liked the Americans. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if they liked the Americans because they were helping them or whether they liked the Americans because they helped their economy and the black market and, and, uh, and everything else. But uh, they were very friendly toward the Americans. I came in contact with a lot of public health people in South Vietnam, South Vietnam. Their uh, their system of uh, health care was really primitive. Uh, each province would have a provincial hospital, and uh, uh, we used to travel into town and, and meet with the uh, the local public health people, and uh, <clears throat> they were actually quite intelligent. And uh, met. surprisingly, a number of them had trained in uh, in either. Uh, Western Europe or the United States, but their hospitals were primitive. Uh, what I mean is that they were quite dirty. There were uh, many times uh, two patients assigned to a bed, and the bed really was not a did not have a mattress. It was more of a, of a, a board like uh, uh, bed, and the, the family usually stayed right there with the patient. And the food that uh, was uh, given to these patients was cooked in a kitchen that had basically a um, um, charcoal burning fire with a big pot of uh, um, something or other that was was uh, cooking over this fire. And uh, I can never, I'll never forget. We used to be down there, and there'd be little, there'd be skinny chickens running around on the floor. And I, I used to swear they used to grab one of these chickens and. Uh, beheaded and dumped it in the pot. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but in general, uh, they had charcoal fires that, uh, and they used those as stoves to, to cook their food. Obviously, uh, uh, nutrition was a problem. Uh, I'm not sure how much in the way of medications, uh, antibiotics and intravenous fluids, and, and of course we're talking 25 years ago, uh, 20 years ago. Um, so the level of sophistication here then was not as good as it is today. And, and, and back there, 20 years ago, it was, it was really uh, poor. Um, we, in, in all of our uh, uh, companies in the field, seem to become more familiar with the uh, local townspeople than you would in a, in a large city. And when I went to Vietnam, one of the uh, one of the things that was being promoted by the army was what they called med caps uh, activities. These were uh, these were uh, trips you would take with uh, with your medics and uh, with a trailer with with medications and. With an interpreter, and uh, you would go into a village, and this was the theory was you were going to win the hearts and minds of the people, and they promoted this. And uh, when I first arrived there, I was very gung ho uh, and wanted to do this, and it was interesting to uh, see the people line up, and and uh, we would examine them to the best of our ability. Um, 
initially I couldn't understand why my medics weren't quite as enthusiastic about this as I was, but uh, uh, there were some towns we went into where my medics wore their flak jackets, their, they brought their M16s, and, and they went into the town and, and basically uh, uh, covered us uh, from a military standpoint because they knew that uh, as friendly as these towns were, that at one time during their tour of duty, a rocket had come in from, uh, from some of these towns into our compound. They didn't trust anyone, and, and probably for good reason. Um, it was interesting because the, the, uh, the town always seemed to have a village chief who, who usually looked like somebody who was 90 years old. Uh, many of these people had black teeth. Uh, because they chewed uh, beetle nuts. Their teeth were totally black. Uh, many of these chiefs wore red turbans on their head. And uh, it didn't take too many of these affairs before you realized that, uh, that the, native, the people on the one hand were trading blue pills for green pills uh, after you left. And on occasion, we found out that the village chief was coming around and charging a small amount of uh, money from each one of these villagers for having seen us, uh, which was uh, obviously corruption. <clears throat> but you did see, uh, you, you saw a lot of uh, um, skin rashes that were infected, uh, a lot of impetigo and things like this in kids, a lot of... Uh, insect bites that were infected, scabs uh, that were infected. Um, there were people who I, I'm sure had tuberculosis that supposedly was rampant in the population. Of course, we had, did not have an x-ray or a machine or whatever to uh, determine this. And there were kids who had congenital anomalies. Uh, um, and uh, although we were not directly involved, there were many Occasions where the military uh, or the army would take kids with hair lips or with uh, other congenital anomalies, bring them to the military hospital and, uh, and operate on them and bring them back. But we did this for a good part of the, at least the first six months that I was there, we went out on these, these uh, med cap activities. And toward the end of my tour there, you sort of uh, got the feeling that you were not really winning too many hearts and minds. That it was probably non-productive, and of course, the closer you got to the time you were leaving, you didn't want to uh, expose yourself uh, too much to uh, any kind of uh, enemy uh, activities. Is it a volunteer situation? Oh yeah, they recommended it, and we we used to do it. do is uh, uh, take a look at some stereotypes that have uh, evolved out of Vietnam. Uh, would you care to talk about, you know, was there the stereotype of the, the GI coming home, the, you know, the, the drug, uh, the drug with the Vietnam veteran? How accurate, you know, from your perspective well, is that stereotype? I, uh, I can only speak from my own personal Correct. experience. Right. Uh, uh, first of all, the main, uh, in, in my experience in Vietnam, there were many different types of GIs. I would say the majority were very, very hard-working uh, uh, young people. I have to say that I was not in a combat situation, but as uh, for kids who were 19, years of age who were uh, away from home many times, many of them for the first time, who were in a relatively unpleasant situation, who, uh, uh, who were given a job to do. The majority of the ones that I knew worked very, very hard and they were very pleasant. They accepted their uh, role and uh, uh, they counted the days to the time they were leaving, but they, <coughs> they worked hard, they played hard. They were extremely innovative. One thing that struck, struck me while I was over there was how innovative these young people were and how to spend time. Uh, you, you 
you'd be amazed at the hobbies kids had. Uh, there were many, many young people who uh, who built model airplanes. The, the, uh, they were able to get the uh, radio-controlled airplanes, which were relatively new at the time, probably fairly cheap through the Pacific Exchange catalog. Uh, they were all into stereos and hi-fis, again, which they could get cheap. And uh, it was amazing how they could have sound systems uh, uh, set up in their in their own little barrack area. But in general, most of them uh, worked very hard. On the other hand, there were a lot of um, GIs over in uh, Vietnam who were uh, very heavily into marijuana. Um, I don't remember a lot of hard drugs at the time. I really think probably pot was the uh, was the uh, the drug of choice at the time, and uh, that was probably the beginning of the of the drug scene. Uh, these these uh, young people were uh, uh, probably had a negative influence on, on the whole situation in Vietnam. Uh, I don't want to say war effort because I'm not so sure that the war effort was right, but it, but as far as um, as far as uh, getting any productivity, and I'm speaking more in terms of the construction and the engineering aspects of it, because I really wasn't involved, but it would frighten me to think that they were also involved in combat. There was a fairly large number who, uh, who basically were interested in, uh, in smoking pot, in, um, in finding out ways to avoid work, uh, who were always looking to go on sick call. Who were uh, angry and resentful, and uh, uh, and really did not want to uh, be disciplined at all. It was interesting in the sense that uh, there was the other the, the other end of the spectrum was the alcohol. Uh, you had the very young, angry pot smokers, you had the older um, non-commissioned officers, the, the master sergeants, many of whom had been in, spent two or three tours in Vietnam, they actually liked it over there, uh, who were heavy, heavy drinkers. And uh, the military promoted drinking as far as I'm concerned because the, uh, the, uh, the, there were um, um, PXs and uh, where uh, cigarettes and alcohol could be uh, bought very, very cheaply. And some of the veteran uh, non-commissioned officers were heavy drinkers. And one of the problems that we had was in, our, in some of the companies that were out in the field, <coughs> the alcoholics, I, I shouldn't use the term out, the, the heavy drinkers and the pot smokers would be at war with each other. Uh, it was not uncommon to have uh, fist fights or uh, uh, all kinds of trauma that occurred because some people were drinking too much, some people were smoking pot too much, and they would all be in on the, on the courier to sick call the next day. Uh, the pot smokers had a way of, of um, banding together. Somehow they had a way of, and I'm not exactly sure how, it was like there was a there was a, um, a culture or a, uh, a way they dressed or a way they acted that you could, uh, they could uh, spot each other very easily and hang around together. And uh, there was absolutely no problem, from what I understand, obtaining pot uh, if, if you wanted to. Uh, it, at one time in my experience over there, our battalion was apparently upgraded from from one class to another class, which meant that uh, we added 300 new uh, soldiers to our battalion. And uh, uh, exactly what you would think would happen, happened. All the surrounding battalions unloaded all their undesirables on, on our battalion. Somehow, at the time, we were putting a new company out in the field, farther down the road, uh, farther away from the uh, base camp. They all ended up 
just word spreads. Sure. They they uh, they uh, they know how to uh, recognize each other and, and and they hang around together. And when you think about it, every one of these companies had a uh, peripheral uh, defense system, and uh, they were all required to take you know, guard duty uh, uh, to protect their, their their other company members. And uh, I am sure that they were smoking pot on the guard tower at night, which would make me nervous if I was uh, out in the middle of nowhere, uh, depending on them. But uh, there no doubt was, uh, were the group who uh, who were heavy pot smokers, they were uh, they were uh, angry uh, for being there. There were the other group who drank too much, and then you had the majority who were, were extremely uh, hardworking, nice people. I've always thought myself, I'm just rambling on here if you want me to rambling. You hear about uh, so many coming back with a drug problem, and some, so many people having flashbacks and uh, um, and whenever someone seemed to have a problem after returning from Vietnam the, the stock answer was well he was in Vietnam well you know I can only I've never a hundred percent understood that myself now I was not in a heavy combat area we <clears throat> we certainly had rocket attacks and uh, uh, everybody was under pressure and, what have you, but I wasn't heavily into the, the combat area, but uh, it seems to me that there are an awful lot of people who spent their year in Vietnam that never had a problem. Um, the, the people that smoked a lot of pot in Vietnam, uh, um, they well come back with some sort of a drug problem, but I can't help but think that uh, they didn't go over there with a personality that uh, that would make them prone to as a uh, as a uh, um, just by their nature to uh, come back with a problem that, uh, and then expect the military blame the military for everything that ever happened to them from that point on. I'm sure this is this is true in many many cases, but I can't help but think that. Uh, I have a feeling there are more people who, whose bad experience in Vietnam was brought on by themselves as much as it was by the, by the war, and uh, uh, they had a bad attitude to start with. And, and I'm sure the, the war was not a good experience for anyone, uh, but I just find it hard. I, I have a feeling that uh, everyone assumes that everyone that set foot in that country came back uh, much different than when they went over there, but in reality, it's probably not true. I'm sure some people had extremely bad experiences over there, especially those involved in combat, seeing friends die and uh, uh, maimed and what have you. <coughs> but it's my understanding that only 10% of the people over there were actually doing combat. 90% of the people were doing support services, and uh, so you you have to think that 90% were relatively safe. And uh, um, so I, I've always Although I was bored and uh, somewhat depressed for the whole year over there, and I certainly I would have tried anything to get out of it, because I not necessarily because I was against the war, but because I just didn't want to go there for a year. Um, in some respects, there are some positive aspects to it. It makes you uh, uh, it makes you uh, uh, stick it out for a year. It makes you figure out ways to spend your time. That, uh, to, uh, to occupy uh, your time uh, when, when you certainly have a lot of time on your hands. You depend on uh, your friends and uh, the people you meet over there for uh, support, just like they depend on you. And, uh, um, uh, you either work at it and, and, and make it work for the year, or, or you don't. I mean, obviously, some people got very depressed had psychiatric problems, and we had psychiatrists that got people shipped out of the country you know, fairly frequently. Um, but, uh, you know, once you finish it, you, you at least feel some sort of a sense of having, having made it and accomplished something, and not necessarily that, 
that you uh, did anything to help the war effort, but you personally had uh, had to live under adversity for a year, and, and you did it, and you came out of it relatively uh, sane, and, and you learned a lot about yourself, and you, uh, you learned to uh, get along with others under dire circumstances. And, uh, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people looked at it from that standpoint, and that's what got them to the end. Doctors stayed one year, but just like the regular uh, I was there a year to the day. Do you, re do you recall the day that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was uh, it was actually uh, funny because uh, <clears throat> I was right, I was near Cameron Bay. And uh, it's interesting, the, the year you're over there, uh, you see nothing but uh, uh, combat uh, uh, aircraft, etc. And every once in a while, we we would go up to Cameron Bay because we sent a lot of uh, people to the hospital up there. We would go up just to visit them and, and actually to give you, again, a diversity once on occasion. And uh, you would see a civilian aircraft in, in a really major part uh, churn to, to get out of there. <clears throat> when my time was getting close, um, actually I was planning on getting married when I came back, and uh, I knew if I left in Cameron Bay, you you landed on the west coast of the United States. If I was willing to go back down to Long Bend, they they had some flights that flew into McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. So uh, I decided to fly into McGuire Air Force Base. And uh, I had heard of people, you were allowed to report to the, uh, to the again, to the debar debarkation center three days prior to the day you, were, you had orders to leave. And I had heard that people at Cameron were getting on planes right away. They were getting out a couple of days early. <clears throat> I went down to Long Bin or, and uh, checked in down there. And it hadn't changed a bit in the whole year that I'd been over there. They gave me a bed to sleep on. I couldn't get manifested on a plane until the exact day that my year was up. And uh, oh, it was obviously an exciting feeling. And, uh, there was always a little fear that something would happen at the last minute that uh, uh, that would prevent you from going home, or that you theoretically might get injured. Or, and all you heard uh, the whole year you were over there was the word "short." Short time. Everybody kept saying "short," you know, and they counted the days. And of course, when you've just arrived in country, that didn't interest you too yeah. much. You hear somebody else was short, but actually, uh, before you know it, your time was short. And um, the day I left. Um, We, once again, got on the bus in Long Bend, we driven to Benoit Air Base. I have to say that I'm probably the only one that spent a year in Vietnam and never set foot in Saigon. I, I still have never been in Saigon. I, I went to some medical meetings uh, down out, outside of Saigon, near, near this area, but I never actually saw the city. In any event, uh, you... Uh, turn in a lot of the gear that they gave you and you put a, a real uniform on uh, for the first time in the year and, uh, and you go over and they give you the piece of paper with your manifest and you sit with all the other people and when when that is, when you have, there's this plane lands and unfortunately 200 guys get off the plane who are starting their year and uh, you kind of wave to them and smile and, and then you walk out and take your seat on the airplane and, when that plane actually takes off and uh, gets airborne and the landing gear gets pulled up, you, you actually breathe a sigh of relief. It's like you, you're actually going home. Um, we went home a little bit different route. Uh, I think we, I don't remember, I think we stopped, I don't know if we stopped in Hawaii, but this time we came through Anchorage, Alaska. There were some strange routes, the guys have told me. And uh, when I was in Anchorage, Alaska, I called Bronx to talk to my future mother-in-law and explain when this thing was going to land in New Jersey. And uh, I remember flying down again, it was at nighttime, uh, out of Alaska, and, and we, uh, they announced we were over in New York State. It actually made your heart flutter almost to think that you were just about home. And we got down over uh, McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, and the, it was raining out. And the pilot, I, I knew my fiancé was waiting down there. 
pilot announced that uh, because the runway was wet, they couldn't land this plane at McGuire, and that he was going on to Kennedy Airport. So we, we flew over and circled Kennedy for quite some time. <coughs> and we finally landed, and it was actually comical because uh, the plane landed, and uh, uh, of course they always bring a military police officer on the planes uh, and inspect them before you, they let you off. But uh, half the people on the plane were in combat fatigues and were filthy, dirty. Other people were in regular uniform. And we basically descended on Kennedy Airport. Nobody went through customs or anything. We just walked through with our bags and got a cab and, and went home. It was, it was obviously a good feeling to, uh, <clears throat> to finally get back in the States and, uh, and see civilization again and have uh, real uh, flush toilets and, and running water and, uh, and whatever. <clears throat> but um, um, it, was a, it was a difficult year for everyone. So, uh, my fiance, who's my present wife, insisted that we drive to Albany. And I said, oh my God, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to drive to Albany. She insisted, and uh, I think we got up to Albany about midnight. And it turns out the people on Park Avenue had a sign across the street, and my father was there, and the neighbors were there when I pulled in the driveway. It was really exciting. Uh, the, oh, that is oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, they had Welcome Home Dick, and it was really that's nice. Really nice. That's that I was going to ask you what was your reaction to the people got married nine days after that. Well, that's, uh, they, they, they were glad. That's nice. I'm glad to hear that. Because well, yeah, I, did, you know, a lot of guys didn't meet that. They, I know. they met other things. You know? I think that. Um, so yeah, I'm so glad you said that. I got out of there in uh, 12 September of '70, and uh, once again, I, I never had the feeling of uh, being looked down upon. But again, I was not a combat soldier. I didn't come back to another military, although I was reassigned uh, and did spend 10 months of my next assignment, which was in Atlanta, Georgia. But I can't say that I, I was ever totally aware of, uh, of a lot of uh, negativism toward uh, Vietnam veterans. But on the other hand, I have a feeling a lot of it came in the ensuing years, the next, from 70 to 73 or 4, whenever the war ended. I think there was so much more negative uh, feeling toward the people. You were right in that transition yeah. period from my dad. I really think that's what happened. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, most of my name. After, after spending a year, did, uh, did you form any opinions about about the war? You, you had alluded well, at one point that you weren't quite sure you know, about about the war. I uh, There were a number of opinions that I formed. One opinion was that uh, I couldn't believe with all the uh, military hardware we had over in that country. Uh, being on an Air Force base, there were, there were F-100s taking off round the clock. Uh, you knew there were B-52 sorties. I couldn't believe that with all the equipment and all the personnel and all the men we had over there, that we could not win that war. It seemed like and, and if the North Viet, or if the Viet Cong were as primitive as I think they were, um, it was amazing to me with all our technology and firepower that we could not be successful. It only pointed up the fact that, uh, that they were fighting in a jungle that uh, was familiar to them and that our leaders totally miscalculated uh, what it would take to, uh, to win any kind of a, a war in that part of the country. And um, it was pretty obvious to me that they could, they could have sent another million men over there and they wouldn't have, uh, they wouldn't have been successful. Um, it, it made me think that the enemy had to have tr 
tremendous ingenuity. This Ho Chi Minh Trail must have been the greatest, uh, uh, much better than any engineering feat that we had because it was, <coughs> one, undiscoverable, two, it had to be destroyed uh, many, many times. And, and they tell, from what I understand, that within 24 hours it would be rebuilt to the point where they could move uh, convoys. Uh, but it became fairly obvious that, uh, that there would not be a military solution to this. Secondly, um, you really came away thinking that, uh, uh, that somebody in their own culture should have been, uh, should have been uh, ruling that land rather than uh, any outside uh, influence. I couldn't help but think that uh, Ho Chi Minh had to be better for, uh, with that country unified than, than uh, being at war with, uh, with each other and uh, in some Western company, uh, country trying to uh, tell them how to run their affairs. Uh, uh, I couldn't even see it for what it would be like if, if we ever did uh, try to organize a, a population that was really not very well educated, but not very sophisticated, but, uh, it would be like starting from scratch. And uh, um, I just, uh, I guess maybe I, I didn't have the feeling at that point that we were not wanted over there and that we were uh, uh, not being supported or, or asked to support the South. But obviously in retrospect, uh, you can't help but think of the tremendous miscalculations. But there are always, the, uh, the, thing, uh, the thing that always amazed me were all these body counts. And, uh, if you really think back to the war, all the reports of the different battles, they were actually reporting numbers of of uh, U.S. or friendly forces that were killed versus enemy. And if you think back on it, there was always two or three times as many enemy. And if that was the case, the uh, population should have been annihilated three times over. So, uh, so obviously, one feeling you, you can't help but come away with is that the military, U.S. military, has a way of, uh, of interpreting things that or either even to the point of being brainwashed that, uh, that things are going their way, that, uh, that there's always something positive, uh, even though it may well be negative. Uh, and uh, I think that's just part of the trend. That, uh, that no one would really come to grips with the fact that, uh, one, we couldn't win, two, we weren't winning, and uh, three, it wouldn't solve anything by sending more men or planes, and that, uh, that their system of, of reporting victories were, were really, they were talking about conventional war in, in, uh, in the sense of World War II, when in reality, um, I don't know that anyone really knew what was happening. That would, uh, that would be my opinion. You also learned, having, not having spent more than five weeks in the military, Just saying this because, in a negative sense, we had uh, we had uh, commanders uh, who insisted on flying over uh, over uh, dangerous uh, combat areas to get out to the troops and to, to find out what was going on, and uh, almost to the point of stupidity. One one story I, I had I never forgot was uh, there was a new um, there was a new general in charge of all engineering in Vietnam who came in and took over for a fellow uh, who went back home. And as part of his uh, indoctrination or whatever, I, he had had at least one tour over there before. But they would bring him around to the different engineer battalions. And obviously, like any situation like this, they would put out a red carpet and, uh, and at, at lunchtime or whatever you wanted. I guess they served the main meal at lunchtime. 
in some of these festivals, they would have something special. I'll never forget this time, uh, this general came, and of course he's got colonels and uh, lieutenant colonels and captains and everybody else with him as uh, his entourage. And, uh, he was coming to our battalion. And of course your commanding officers are all spit and polished that day. And this fellow uh, sat next to me at lunch. He was a very nice guy. He seemed a little tired and uh, he seemed more interested in talking to me, who was a physician, than about and to any of the other people about what was going on from a construction standpoint. We had a nice talk, and uh, when I went up to uh, Cameron to leave for r and &R, it came out in the news that uh, this helicopter had been shot down, and this fellow, the, uh, this general, who had only been over there a couple of months, and a number of other officers had been shot down and killed. So uh, there's always those kinds of stories. But, uh, there, you know, there was, even though the military man was trained uh, in his own way, they, you know, they were still human beings and they were very, very, many of them were very, very nice people. And, uh, um, they were just oriented toward the uh, military and career and success and victory and, and other people were oriented other ways, but they're still very, very nice human beings, many of them. The generals and the, and the, the higher ranking officers, I would have to say, were very, very bright people who would make it anywhere in, in civilian industry. Some of the lower officers uh, may not have been that impressive, but uh, the ones that made it that high were, were quite impressive people. I don't know what else to say. I, uh, you know, in retrospect, uh, reading and seeing what happened, and, uh, I think now you can look back and see how we got led down the garden path. protesters uh, were, uh, were kind of an irritant at the time. Uh, I think most people would agree that they were right. And, and I, don't see how, uh, I don't see how you can uh, how you can deny that fact. I mean, in retrospect, you really wonder what we were trying, what we would accomplish. I think the, the theory was that if, if Vietnam fell, that Southeast Asia fell, and the, you had the whole domino theory, when in reality, I think today, over the last 20 years, we've grown to realize that, uh, um, that we, this theory doesn't hold, that we're probably strong enough to be, you know, to be more isolated, that we don't have to worry about uh, countries like this that are not industrialized, that, uh, that uh, and I'm sure that, that the Russia, Russia and the other communist countries aren't as interested in uh, moving into a lot of these, a lot of territory when they can't even handle their own problems at home. And it's the same for the United States. We can't solve everyone else's problems and, and to try to fight a war halfway around the world. Uh, um, unfortunately, at the time, it's not realized it's an impossibility. But, uh, um, but I think it is today, isn't it? Oh yeah, it, is, it sure is. Can now, uh, can we wrap it up? With when we, when we met before we started, you mentioned the fact that most of the kids in high school are 17. They haven't, they haven't experienced this, and us old timers kind of assume that they have. Mm -hmm. It's the anniversary of Woodstock. And sure. one last question, based on your experience in Vietnam and the things that have happened, are there any final words for those kids that we see in that? That we see in the state? Well, I think that uh, I think you should try to learn as much as you can about the Vietnam War. I think you should try to uh, understand the, the thinking at the beginning of the war. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot to be learned. Um, you, um, there was there were a lot of misconceptions that hopefully will not be made in the future. That that a few more foot soldiers will will solve the problem and then we needed more and more the misconception that uh, conventional forces could ever win a war in, in, a, in, a, in a heavily jungle-like uh, country against people that live there. But I think you have to, uh, you have to look at history prior to, uh, to Vietnam and, uh, and realize that uh, it may not have been so easy to, uh, to 
to uh, anticipate what was what was going to happen. And, uh, um, at the time, the general population was uh, <coughs> all had this feeling that communism was taking over the world, and, uh, and somehow. Um, until the war was half over or three quarters over, people didn't. People only started to realize that maybe this isn't worth losing lives, and uh, it, it's hard to believe uh, that it took so long uh, to realize this. But I think that uh, um, I think that it uh, it was a difficult experience that I don't know how many million men had to go through. Um, that uh, it was uh, in a part of the world that uh, was not the most pleasant place to be, and that there were some people who felt they were doing service to their country, and there were others who, who were there because they had no choice, and, and there were others who realized that maybe this wasn't the best service to their country. And, um, uh, I think there's a, there's a lot to be learned from the historical, from the Sociological, from uh, from many many different perspectives, and, uh, and I would try to learn as much as you, as you can about it, and uh, put yourself in the uh, in the uh, shoes of some of these 18, 19 year old kids that were told they had no choice; they have to go, and uh, and uh, to a godforsaken part of the world, be separated from their families, and, and do something that uh, they really didn't understand. The reasons for, and I guess maybe most wars are like this. People don't understand the reasons, and, uh, and, but this is the first war where people eventually uh, follow their own uh, thinking, and, and, uh, and, uh, and I think most people realize that probably it was a lost cause from the start. And I feel sorry for any any family that lost a, uh, a family member. Because you can't help but think it. Although they were doing their duty in retrospect, it was such a waste. But, it, but in reality, all wars are worth. I mean, if you, if you really think about it, here we are at the time of the Vietnam War. China was our bitter enemies. China uh, was on the border of Vietnam. Um, uh, the North Vietnamese have, have uh, occupied the country. They're now making overtures to. Friendly with the United States, China, up until recently, was all of a sudden has become our ally. Japan was our bitter enemies in the Second World War. Now they're they're uh, industrialized and uh, our ally. When you really think about it, <coughs> anyone dying in a war is 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 really ludicrous because uh, the way history evolves. Twenty years later, they may be our best friend. And it's, it's almost ridiculous to think that anyone has to go to war and, and die. No. And maybe the Woodstock people were right to start make love and, <laughs> and don't make war, right? I really haven't given you much of a historical uh, perspective. It was it sounds to me like more of a like personal feelings about uh, what took place and how it affected me and this and the other thing. But uh, uh, you don't talk about it too much anymore. Every once in a while, you run into somebody who spent a year there, and you like to find out where they were and in relation to you, when they were there in relation to yourself. And, uh, and I always think of it in terms of anybody that was there before I was there had it worse than I did because there were <coughs> fewer of us there. There were there were uh, there was probably less organization and, and what have you. And, uh, many of them were just military advisors working with the Vietnamese uh, military that had to be talked to. Them. On the local, uh, uh, in the local villages, uh, like the natives did, it had to be very difficult. I met a guy who wouldn't give any bullets for the first. He came over. He was over in Da Nang. Yeah. Right. He had to be there as soon as it started, like in May. You know, the first Marines went in. They couldn't have any bullets. You know, yeah. inside the perimeter. Once they went out, they they, they were they there. As a like a uh, security force or for the, for the police work. Yeah. Like that. It's right after Play Coup, and he yeah. uh, uh, he went in like in May. Maybe one of the very first that went over, you know, but, uh, that's what they were their security forces. And, you know, they just kept going. You know, and, uh, yeah.
Definitely, thank you very much. Okay, it was a pleasure. I hope it helped. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope it helps You're somebody. Kidding. Oh, you were great. Funny, you know, I just started, like, when's the last time I talked to anybody?